Dr. Lauren McCullough. Dr. McCullough is an assistant professor of epidemiology at Rollins School of Public Health. And she's also a member of the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Program at Winship Cancer Institute. She will present Promoting Breast Cancer Health Equity in Metro Atlanta. Dr. McCullough. Trying to get this. Okay, can everyone see the slides okay? Everything looks perfect. All right. Okay, so thank you for joining us. I'll talk about um, breast cancer equity um, in Metro Atlanta. And I'll just start by saying um, breast cancer disparities is a really sort of complex problem um, when we think about sort of potential drivers of desperate outcomes. Um, for women with breast cancer in Metro Atlanta. And so I think it requires um, often some complex strategies. And um, this is just a pictorial representation of the things that our research group is really thinking about. Um, we think above and below the skin. So above the skin being social determinants um, of health, below the skin being you know, molecular epidemiology, tumor characteristics, the tumor microenvironment, um, and then really understanding how um, things happen across the life course. Um, carcinogenesis is a long process. And so really understanding what's happening in early life throughout the reproductive period and up to the diagnosis period um, is all important in understanding disparities. And so I'm gonna begin um, with this paper, um, which really sort of set off <laughs> the research that I'm gonna to share today. Um, this paper was published in Cancer Epidemiology in 2016. Um, and it was looking at black white disparities in breast cancer mortality in the 50 largest cities in the United States during two different time periods. Um, what really caught my attention and the attention of my colleagues here in Atlanta was that they um, cited the city of Atlanta being um, having the greatest um, black white disparity and fastest growing black white disparity over the 10 year time period. Um, and so as we began to dig further into this paper and, and the data resources, um, we did realize that the resource was the 500 Cities Project, which is out of the CDC. And when we looked at Atlanta, they really defined Atlanta as the city of Atlanta. Um, and for those of us that grew up here, like myself, or live and work here, we know that um, we typically define Atlanta as Metro Atlanta, um, the five sort of major counties, Fulton, DeKalb, um, Gwinnett, Cobb, and Clayton. Um, and so really, they were just defining this small part of Atlanta highlighted here in red. Um, and the reason this is problematic is because um, of small numbers. So over the entire period, five-year period, there are about 2,000 cases, um, whereas in Metro Atlanta, there are about 9,000 cases per five-year period. And so obviously the small numbers um, effects are um, subject to serious associations. Um, it was also an open cohort, and so women were moving in and out of the observation period, which, you know, if there's differential migration by race, you can see um, some biased effects. And then for the denominator, they use census data. Um, and, and not necessarily women who were at risk um, of the event. And so this led us to rethink our approach um, to this. And you know, as scientists and clinicians and researchers working in the city um, of Atlanta and Metro Atlanta and on behalf of the state, um, we thought that we should do a better job of really trying to quantify the disparity. Um, and so we did, we looked at this and you can see here during these two time periods, for breast cancer specific mortality, um, 2.23 um, was the hazard ratio. And then the second time period, 2010 to 14, it was a hazard ratio of 2.42. So we concluded that the disparity was not growing over the 10 year time period, but nonetheless, there was a disparity. And this is something that is known. Um, disparities exist and persist across the United States. The Southeastern United States is um, particularly um, relevant when we think about um, breast mortality disparities by race. And so you can see Georgia highlighted here. And additionally, around the same time, we were working on an, another paper using SEER registry data um, from 1990 to 2014. Um, and what we found was really interesting and shocking. Um, you can see these curves here, um, non hispanic Blacks are the solid lines, um, non-Hispanic whites, the, the dashed lines. 
And the conclusion from this figure is really race um, seemed to be a stronger predictor of death than age. Um, we would expect for these colors to track together, um, but you see no matter what the age, black women um, had worse um, breast cancer outcomes than white counterparts. So our mission and objective has become to solve this. Um, and really to uncover the drivers of black white disparities in breast cancer in Metro Atlanta, um, going from the most proximal drivers like the tumor microenvironment, to those that you think of as being really distal like structural determinants of health. Um, and to execute these research projects, we really have relied heavily on the resources of the Georgia Cancer Registry, which um, Dr. Ward just presented, um, and also the Winship Cancer Institute. Um, um, the tissue and specimen archives in pathology. And so I'll just highlight some of um, our recent findings, beginning with tumor characteristics um, and also highlighting the trainees that have worked with me on these various projects. Um, and so we looked at stage ER status and molecular subtype. Um, and you can see here when we look by ER status, we have more um, than a, a twofold hazard of death um, for black women, um, I'm sorry, for ER positive versus ER negative disease in terms of race disparities. Um, and similarly, you look at luminal A and also luminal B, you see um, more than a twofold hazard of death. Um, and when you look at what we typically think of as being the more um, aggressive um, cancer types, ER negative and triple negative, the disparity is not as pronounced. Um, the disparity is there, but you know, not more than twofold like we're seeing. Um, and so what it tells us is um, while disparities in ER negative and triple negative disease are definitely relevant, um, particularly for the African-American community, um, disparities um, are greatest in, in these tumors, which we typically think of as being treatable. treatable. Um, they have effective treatment regimens. And so, um, you know, it's not that we need to come up with a, with a new treatment. There are treatments that exist. And so understanding why these women are having poorer outcomes than their white counterparts um, is an important question. We've also looked at um, genomic testing in the context of um, receipt of Oncotype DX. Um, this was among women diagnosed with um, earlier stage, so stage one through three A, no negative ER positive breast cancer. Um, what we found was um, ODX testing was relatively consistent between blacks and white, black and white women um, in Metro Atlanta. Um, black women had slightly higher ODX scores as evidence um, in this figure. Um, you can see sort of the distribution among Blacks um, is a little bit more right skewed. Receipt of chemotherapy was actually um, pretty comparable between these race groups. Um, so Black women with low scores were slightly more likely to receive chemotherapy when perhaps um, it wasn't necessary. And Black women with high scores were a little less likely to receive chemotherapy um, when it should have been indicated. But what was really interesting in, in these findings is that black women with a lower current score were more than twice as likely to die compared to white women with a lower current score. Um, we would have expected, um, you know, given their, their low Oncotype DX um, scores that we would not have seen robust disparities in this group, um, yet they were still more than twofold. Moving on to treatment and quality of care, um, we've looked at treatment delay um, to try and understand how that may be a driver of disparities. Um, black women were more likely to experience delays in treatment initiation um, compared to whites, but we did not find evidence that delay was actually associated with mortality disparities. In terms of receipt of guideline concordant care, this study was based um, off NCCN guidelines. Um, and what we observed was that black women were more likely to be um, concordant with treatment guidelines compared to, to whites. And this is in Metro Atlanta. So women um, are getting their treatments, they're getting the right treatments, um, but still they were more than twice as likely to die. Um, and I wanna clarify here that we're, we're looking at initial treatment. So for women who are on endocrine therapy, we were not able to look at long-term adherence to drugs, um, just the initial treatment. Um, and this was also surprising to find that women who are got life important um, still have um, poor outcomes, Black women do compared to their white counterparts. And then looking at characteristics of surgical facilities, um, we found that women treated at high versus low volume facilities had a 40% reduction in breast cancer mortality 
Um, this was white women compared to black women treated at high versus low volume facilities, actually had a 32% increase in breast cancer mortality. Um, so within the same types of facilities, we're seeing um, black women having poorer outcomes. Um, in terms of comorbid conditions, um, I am really interested in and our group is really interested in obesity and these maps um, really give all the justification as to why. Um, so on the left is the prevalence of obesity among non-Hispanic whites in the U.S. Um, and on the right is the prevalence of obesity among non-Hispanic blacks in the U.S. Um, and while this includes all individuals, I can say that um, about 80 of African-American women are overweight or obese compared to um, about um, half of white women. And so um, obesity is a major concern because um, black women are more likely to be overweight and obese at diagnosis and thus present with obesity related comorbid conditions like cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, um, and can have reductions in immune functioning. Um, and so obesity, um, presence or the comorbid conditions related to obesity can actually affect um, treatment efficacy as well as tumor progression. And this has all been outlined in um, a commentary written by um, my student Katie Ross and I. And so to understand really the, how obesity is a driver, we've really gone below the skin um, to, to get more um, information. And so I'll begin with um, the study by um, myself and Ray um, Leniak looking at crown-like structures um, as it relates to um, breast cancer disparities. So crown-like structures or CLS is a histologic hallmark of um, the pro-inflammatory process in fat tissue. And so there are these macrophages that um, surround dying adipocytes um, and sort of look like a crown as evidenced in the, in the picture. Um, and what we found was that BMI is associated with increased um, crown-like structures in the breast tissue. Um, and so while that association is there, it is important to note that um, women can also have presence of CLS even if they're not um, overweight or obese by WHO definitions. Um, and to look at CLS, we were using a CD68 um, antibody to, to stain for um, the presence of CLS. So even though BMI does associate with CLS, um, we were also interested in understanding whether or not it was more prevalent among black women and it was overall, but once you actually control for BMI, um, we did not see any evidence that, that black women were more likely to have these lesions. Um, and we also didn't find in our small study at Emory that CLS was associated with overall prognosis, uh, but we did have some methodologic challenges um, and the number of specimens we were able to get access to. Um, again, we use a CD68 um, stain. There are others out there that could be relevant, particularly for M2 macrophages. Um, and then also we didn't have the power to look at tumor heterogeneity. So one hypothesis is that um, CLS would impact overall prognosis because um, it works to reduce endocrine therapy effectiveness. Um, and just with our small numbers, we were not able to look at this um, by ER status. And so that's an ongoing area of research in our group. Um, and then second, working with um, Whitney, we've looked at obesity-associated tumor methylation in, in the breast tumor tissue, um, just trying to understand whether or not obesity actually drives um, changes in the DNA methylome. Um, and so we've had um, CPG sites associated with um, these three genes listed here come up as being important um, and potentially differential by race or ER status, but importantly associated with overall mortality. And PSMB1 and QSOX1 um, are, have been implicated in, in carcinogenesis. In terms of sociodemographic characteristics, um, we have looked at um, several. We'll start with um, insurance where we found that Black women with private insurance or Medicare um, had uh, 2.5 times the hazard of death compared to white women with similar coverage. Um, just like we saw with tumor characteristics, the disparities among uninsured or women on Medicaid were much less pronounced, um, nonetheless present, but definitely not twofold. We also saw that women who lived in high, um, in neighborhoods characterized as um, having high SES, 
had 2.25 times the hazard of death compared to white women living in similarly high um, SES neighborhoods. And when you looked at the disparity among women who lived in neighborhoods um, characterized as um, a lower SES, the disparity which was much less pronounced. And so these results I think are interesting because um, we typically think of access to insurance, having living in high SES neighborhoods um, as um, metrics of health equity um, as sort of characterized by this cartoon. We're getting everyone the support that they need to be able to have the desirable outcome, in this case, watching the so soccer game. Um, but our group has really started to think about, you know, the, the continuum from equity to justice, which is really removing whatever barriers are there, um, causing disparate outcomes um, in the first place. And so as we are looking at these data and understanding um, the, the disparities and sort of the drivers, um, our group has really become interested um, in these sort of social drivers and social determinants of health. And so we've began by doing um, some spatial analyses to really understand where are the hotspots of, of breast cancer disparities um, and equitable outcomes um, in the state. Um, and this work is being led by Rebecca Nash, who's a um, doctoral student in the um, epidemiology department. And so you can see on the left, we, we've created these um, smooth rates of breast cancer deaths for non-Hispanic whites on the top and non-Hispanic blacks on the bottom. And through new methodologic approach, approaches, we've been able to map the ratio of rates of breast cancer deaths. And so you can sort of see these hotspots, um, Metro Atlanta, Fulton and DeKalb come up as one, Columbus, Savannah, and then an, an entire spread between Macon and Athens um, sort of all emerge as being areas where we have pronounced black-white disparities in breast cancer outcomes. And then similarly, using the same approaches um, for Atlanta, non-Hispanic white um, blacks on the left and non-Hispanic whites here. Uh -oh. And then the ratio of rates mapping both. Um, and so you can see here some of Cobb up to Roswell, Decatur, Tucker, some of Brookhaven. Um, this is really city of Atlanta downtown. Um, and in this one right here, we think it may be an artifact of the smoothing. Um, this is Sandy Springs and, and Buckhead. Um, it's, we, we think we're getting this hot spot because of the borrowing of information from Cobb and are still exploring that. But there are areas that are, that are um, doing better and areas that are doing worse. And um, given some of these initial data, we've really begun to think more about um, what sort of defines where people live. And redlining has come up as um, one potential avenue to, to better look at some of these associations. Um, and so redlining was a part of the New Deal in the 1930s. And it really is just the systematic denial of mortgage based on place. Um, and so this is the historic map from 1938. And you can see some of these redlined areas, Sweet Auburn, um, City of Decatur and Oakhurst, where I currently live. Um, the Atlanta University Center, Bankhead, English Avenue, Grant Park, Summer Hill, Pittsburgh, um, and then down below Carver Homes, Joyland Park. This is actually where my family um, grew up. And so looking at these spatial approaches, we've been able to understand, you know, how they associate with breast cancer. And what we found is that redlining has been associated and does associate in Atlanta with a 60% increase in breast cancer mortality. Um, and this is after adjusting for both age um, and within our study population, 80% of non-Hispanic Black women lived in a red line area compared to only 20% of, of non-Hispanic White women. Um, and while Atlanta is undergoing gentrification, this data is from 2010 to 2014. Um, and so, you know, the, this will continue to be looked at over time as these neighborhoods change. We've also looked at Linden bias, which is a systematic denial of mortgage based on an applicant's race or ethnicity. Um, and we found that Linden bias was associated with 14% decrease in breast cancer mortality after adjusting for both age and stage. Um, and it's sort of the opposite of what we saw for redlining. Um, redlining this area was kind of highly, um, um, the denials of mortgage were high, but for Linden bias, um, the denials of mortgage based on race were high in sort of the opposite areas. Um, and as would be expected, only 26% of non-Hispanic Blacks lived in these neighborhoods, whereas 60% of non-Hispanic Whites lived in areas of pronounced lending bias. 
And so this made us wonder, well, you know, how does all of this relate molecularly? How does it drive tumor outcomes? And so we've gone back below the skin to look at the sort of these structural and social determinants of health and how they relate to the DNA methylome. Um, and what we found is that there are several probes that um, do seem to modulate um, the breast tumor DNA methylome um, by sort of neighborhood economic factors like job density and college graduation rates. And a lot of these perturbations are, you know, related to inflammation and ER activation um, and NF-kappa beta. And so this is really early evidence that um, epigenomic perturbations may actually alter endocrine therapy effectiveness and could be relevant um, for race disparities, particularly in ER positive disease. And so with that, I will acknowledge um, all our collaborators um, in the schools of public health and medicine, um, the trainees in the schools of public health and medicine, our staff, um, our consumer advocate, who's a two-time breast cancer survivor, um, and our research funding.